Thank you so much for having me. In particular, a big thank you to Luciana and Sid and Antonio. Um, it's a great pleasure to be, even if it's just virtually, back to Sir. <laughs> um, and as you were mentioning, I had um, the, the, the chance to be there for at least a year, and it was a great pleasure to collaborate also with other colleagues there. So it feels very well to, to be with you today. Um, and in, before the event, um, we were discussing about what research I should be sharing today. And as it is uh, addressing in particular junior researchers within their PhD um, process, um, I'm sharing now about my PhD project and thesis that I finished, which is, as you said, it's very different from what I'm doing now. But if there would be someone um, in the audience who would have questions or anything about my current research, uh, obviously I'm more than happy to address this in, in the discussion. Um, I just quickly also would um, say before I start that I understood this invitation also in a way, I will obviously talk about my research, but also address a couple of comments about the specific process of doing the PhD thesis and how to survive this demanding period well, uh, just as my very personal and subjective lessons learned from that process. Um, <clears throat> so I would be start to share uh, my presentation, but I leave before a link in the chat for everyone. I will tell you when you will need it, um, but this is just to give you, while I'm presenting, a very little hint a bit of, um, to understand a little bit better my empirical case for everyone who's not familiar with that. Okay, so <clears throat> this thesis was uh, formally completed and defended, and I got my certificate in the beginning of 2018. And this is also to start with um, <clears throat> the information. I took around six years to do that which is for, for German standards where I completed my thesis rather long. Um, but I just say this also to defend that I think it's very important to take that time until a thesis is properly done. Uh, but I come back to that at the very end. So just for the purpose of the presentation, I kind of reformulated a little bit the, the, the title of my thesis. Um, so it is still about democracy under construction and thinking reflexively about technologies of participation. But I come to the term of technologies of participation as well. So <clears throat> in my uh, uh, presentation, I want to quickly focus on those four components. I will talk uh, quickly about the motivation and aims. I will talk about um, or give a rough overview of the development of the argument and structure of the thesis. And then I will summarize what I see as main contrib contributions. I might skip um, what I see as domains for further research because we can get, uh, get back to that in the discussion to leave a bit of time for that. Um, but I also would like to share some practical experiences, as I said, and lessons learned uh, from this process of working on my thesis. Um, but now, so to take you on that journey uh, to understand what empirical phenomenon I was fascinated by, uh, when I started my thesis, I would like to invite you now to look uh, quickly into this link up to minute two and 50 seconds. Uh, it's Ségolène Royal speaking, and when she finishes, I think you can come back to me. Um, and if you have switched off the mic, everyone will appreciate. Okay, I assume that you might have got an impression of um, kind of a still a bit recent um, phenomena, which is um, organizing, designing, and implementing transnational forms of citizen engagement. And um, <clears throat> this is something that has been, um, in particular, originating from Europe, but often in collaboration um, from organizations based in Europe and in the, in the US. Um, <clears throat> and what is at stake here is kind of a evolving um, innovation um, movement of participatory democracy, so to speak. Um, however, it's very interesting to look into how this is done, what claims about democracy are at stake, and also what attempts are conducted to spread and to kind of um, diffuse this around the world. So this is what I um, got increasingly um, curious about, how that works. And so my main motivation then was to make sense of these current attempts of innovating democracy for transnational governance. Often this comes in, co in um, combination or in alliance with international organizations like United Nations, but also other international organizations have been one of the kind of pull and push 
um, organizations in these developments. So now, studying the emergence and establishment of this very specific citizen engagement instrument, which is called Worldwide Views, and the implicit democratic normative commitments it brings about was um, one of my curiosities. So what I was doing then was to focus on the organizing practices and the involved micropolitics of negotiating these desired forms of democracy that you might imagine might be understood and desired very differently from <clears throat> uh, depending on where you are situated um, on this globe, but also obviously on many more factors, and we get to that. So this specific case study was uh, one out of several attempts uh, doing this methodology, which, they, which is called Worldwide Views. Um, over the last decades. Um, I actually I have stopped counting them, but I think the last one uh, was conducted in 2018 and it was like every two, three years that um, this uh, methodology was implemented and often linked to a specific policy issue. In that case that I was studying um, on biodiversity. And so <clears throat> it was developed and implemented to produce a global public view which was meant as a contribution to the United Nations Conference on Biodiversity. My case that I studied was in 2013. The video that you saw was about a case in 2015. It was just showing a, a shorter video. <laughs> That's why I took that video. Um, <clears throat> but to study this as a case of emergent standard formation, standards about how to do citizen engagement. And so the driving organization, um, behind this um, citizen engagement methodology is and was the Danish Board of Technology, which is um, situated in Copenhagen, together with a, an alliance of around um, 34 sites and in 25 countries and organizations are, um, involved in all these uh, different sites and countries. And in this specific implementation involving 3000 citizens between around 100 citizens at each site. Um, <clears throat> so the aim of my study was overall to develop a distinct empirical reconstructivist approach which focused on the social construction of democracy in transnational citizen engagement practices. The second aim was of rather analytical nature to understand how different modes of ordering, in my case, I looked into uh, particular two different analytical repertoires coming from new institutionalism, looking into rule making and more from the symbolic interactionists, um, science, uh, studies of science, sociology of science, um, and the concept of boundary works of how these different modes of ordering work together in conducting transnational citizen engagement practices. And then <clears throat> for my argumentation, I began with my first claim that I assumed that alternative vision of democracy compete for their realization throughout these transnational citizen engagement practices. So what do I mean by that? I will um, use now here quickly the occasion to clarify some terminology on that related to democracy and engagement. So in my empirical constructivist approach, I understood democracy not as a predefined normative ideal as obviously also um, extensively or substantially discussed in democratic theory. Instead, I turned democracy rather into an empirical question in the sense of understanding what actors involved in organizing and implementing these um, <clears throat> methodologies, what they intend to do and how they actually do um, these uh, processes related to specific claims about democracy. Um, and so thereby I built on the tradition of various uh, research streams, which evolved also in different contexts, but majorly also from uh, science and technology uh, inspired um, approaches um, reflecting upon democracy and participation. And so this is why I distinguish between that democracy can be understood as something which exists through the inscription of actors' visions of democracy, onto a specific participatory methodology design and the actual enactment of such visions when 
those methodologies become implemented. And so my research questions um, <clears throat> then were focusing in particular on the practices of organizing um, transnational citizen engagement procedures. And the questions I addressed were how do practices in transnational citizen engagement become ordered in an instrument? Uh, so I use a little bit synonymously um, methodology and instrument with a fixed and coherent functional design that aims at working smoothly across these very different sites. And then also over time, as it is meant as a methodology that can be um, kind of repeated and implemented again, also independently on what policy issue they might be applied to. In that case, it was a biodiversity. Um, how are uh, certain visions of democracy inscribed in the setup and design of a transnational citizen engagement inst instrument and what kind of actual versions of democracy become enacted in practice. Um, and last but not least, the question about micropolitics, so which mi micropolitics of sh shaping dominating or also divergent visions of democracy um, and negotiation struggles are at work when transnational citizen engagement instruments are designed, developed and implemented. And so how to actually do this then um, in this case, uh, case study. Um, <clears throat> in order uh, to understand these visions of democracy uh, and how they might compete with each other, um, I selected three specific design components, which are very common to, um, to kind of uh, uh, attract a lot of discussion and debate also in this um, literature that is in particular inspired by democratic theory and looks into how to translate this now in accurate um, and adequate design forms for organizing engagement. Um, and I took those three that are listed here, um, assuming that they might in particular uh, work as a platform to discuss also diverging values around democratic preferences. So one is about selecting and recruiting citizens which is about often the question how to represent um, in a democratic way society. The second one was about structuring dialogue and citizens use, which is often about how shall citizens and participants um, discuss and debate together and how to structure that. And the last one was about setting the agenda and providing information about the policy issue at stake, in that case about global biodiversity. And then also about the question, how to construct democratic presentations of this specific issue at stake, just for you to uh, imagine this a bit better. Obviously, biodiversity is one of those issues where you easily can imagine that it depends on if we are talking about coastal uh, countries or uh, countries with um, huge desert zones. So it very much depends on the specific situated context um, and in ecological terms and biological terms of a country of how there might be stakes about how the issue of biodiversity actually becomes constructed in such a context. Okay, um, I won't dive deep in this table, but this is just to kind of obviously uh, acknowledge that there is a lot of literature from democratic theory out there that often becomes a major reference. And there is our strands around rather, and I kind of simplify here when clustering it, in those uh, three um, columns. Uh, obviously there are streams around rather liberal and representative democ democracy oriented um, theories. There are others more around deliberative and pluralistic democracy uh, values and others that rather counter kind of the um, established and formalized um, uh, forms of representative democracy with other kind of radical um, and emancipatory dem democracy oriented um, visions. Um, all of them come with dedicated values that they highlight or prioritize over others. Um, and then often this literature then builds on this and develops further suggestions of how to design appropriate um, engagement procedures. They come with conclusions for how a, an appropriate design solution might work. I, I don't go into detail here, but all of this has developed over time and has um, 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 suggested a lot of very different um, design solutions, but among the more prominent ones that are, uh, I also list here are, for instance, deliberative polling, 
um, which would be more in this kind of stream of liberal and representative democracy, highlighting in particular forms of voting, uh, following um, certain um, formats of, of deliberation and discussion um, versus other formats uh, like the consensus conference or citizen jury, which are not only about coming um, to a specific representative um, form of um, conclusion, but where actually the way of how discussion takes place in a very Habermasian way is um, influenced uh, to be understood that um, deliberations and debate should target kind of a consensus among participants, which obviously comes with other uh, implications of how to moderate such a discussion. And then there are other formats which, and there are obviously many, many more, which would represent also more radical democracy or emancipatory democracy oriented approaches. So I just want to make one thing clear. My uh, um, intention was not to measure anyhow like democratic quality or something like this in this specific methodology. So I take this as a kind of um, information in the background that obviously a lot of these actors also are informed by uh, democratic theory and the way of how they make claims might refer to that. But I was more interested in how they actually intend and argue and then actually make their very own conclusions and translations from that. But as I said, there was this other um, more analytical curiosity in studying this, which is inspired by the sociology of standards. And there are different strands that I took into account in particular um, those that I already mentioned in the beginning. So different modes of ordering. On the one hand, more uh, influenced by neo-institutionalist organizational studies, um, which has made a lot of claims around uh, standards as rulemaking, uh, but then taking a different um, um, kind of tradition of, of uh, literature into account, which um, evolved around the concept of boundary object. And so um, also not going very deep into this year, but obviously um, <clears throat> there are very obvious um, differences between also those different literature traditions. So while um, the, within the new institutionalism, um, it's very much emphasized that the meaning dimension of ordering uh, is at stake while the perspective, and this is why I felt that it was very kind of complementary also to use those different streams together, coming from a symbolic interactionist accounts tradition of science studies where meaning and the material dimension of ordering um, comes um, into uh, place and gets importance. And so looking in those different dimensions uh, helped me to understand in particular these processes of standardization across different sites and also over time. Okay, so um, also keeping an eye on the time. Um, however, there was this, as I indicated in the beginning, the specific interest in those micro politics. So like how um, <clears throat> actually those different competing visions become um, a matter of uh, struggle and negotiation. Um, so then how to study this? So my research strategies um, were um, in particular following this process of setting up and implementing this design of the worldwide views on biodiversity at different sites um, and uh, following different organizations involved in that. So in terms of data collection, that meant that I studied um, through ethnographic fieldwork at multiple sites over two years between 2012 and 2014. Um, but with a specific focus <clears throat> on two sites, which was the US and the German implementation sites, um, as well as the coordinating site of the Danish Board of Technology. Um, and so I looked into their training sessions that they offered to all those many partner organizations around the world. Um, I looked into um, uh, also complementary interview data with um, organizers also around the world to complement the specific sites. Um, <clears throat> I collected diverse empirical data, including also interviews uh, with um, participants in the meetings, uh, in the actual citizen engagement meetings. Um, I conducted participant observation of organizational preparatory meetings, but also obviously then once the, the event was happening. Uh, and looked in lots of published but also unpublished documents um, <clears throat> documenting the whole process. 
And then I use kind of an iteratively um, a process or evolving process between conceptual phases and fieldwork phases and developed a coding system to specify my analysis and used a contextualist approach um, <clears throat> on grounded theory, um, which link categories, their properties, their sub-properties as elements of getting towards a theory. Okay, so as I said, I had a specific look into the central organizing and coordinating organizations. That is the Danish Board of Technology with the acronym DBT here. And then in the two um, lower boxes in yellow, I had a look into the other uh, specific implementation sites at the US and in Germany. And now I could give you a bit of a um, well, more in-depth um, um, insight into how these three different design categories that I already um, um, presented earlier, how, how those struggles evolve, but I will very briefly uh, just highlight a couple of those. So the Danish Board of Technology was responsible to provide this global design, had training sessions where organizing um, institutions were involved, they were trained on how to do this on site, um, but obviously then the local organizations had to make sense out of this themselves and uh, in this kind of translation process, obviously also different additional meanings and attributed um, <clears throat> desires of how to conduct uh, these methodologies appeared. And for this example around citizen recruitment and selection, so who will participate um, <clears throat> and how do we select them? It was already very obvious that different um, kind of visions were at stake. So the Danish Board of Technology had a rather survey-like um, idea of conducting this in a way also to, um, in a very statistical sense uh, of representing, um, uh, there should be kind of a stratified random selection. So it should kind of be characteristic for certain, for certain so social structural um, <clears throat> um, characteristics of each society. Um, so uh, that meant that they um, kind of um, aggregated potential uh, panels um, towards having a gender balance, but also age-wise. Um, <clears throat> and then, for instance, there came, this was countered by the US, where there was much more an idea, it should be much more inclusive, so su such a deliberation process should give uh, a chance to people who otherwise are marginalized and now should become a bit more overrepresented. So they were targeting in particular, for instance, also homeless people um, and other kind of um, uh, population groups um, with strategic targeting them. While for instance, in Germany, they were rather worried that they wouldn't get at all uh, sufficiently participants. So they uh, simply applied a self-selection process so they made a huge announcement that uh, participants could uh, join this gathering. And so they were more chronologically going through the participant uh, registration list and who comes first was in the panel. So that was already very obvious that although there was a very clearly described ideal type uh, version of how to recruit and select participants at the different sites, there were very different notions of how to do this now, right? And um, what was very clearly meant as an attempt to standardize across sites was that the Danish Board of Technology had uh, written a very detailed manual of how to conduct this methodology. They had conducted these training sessions also in a performative way that they had uh, trained the organizers to um, simulate such a panel um, with very clear schedules, with very clear, clear seating orders. So they had gone all themselves through this experience of how this should be conducted. And obviously we had here like a mixture of, on the one hand, material forms of how this uh, attempts of standardizing um, were trying to be uh, mainstreamed, um, but as well other boundary object um, types of, of um, um, diffusion, uh, because obviously those methodologies um, always allowed some degree of interpretive flexibility. So we could go into also how the dialogue was structured. I just want to, um, to take this very brief example. So there was even, as you can see in, in this image, there was this kind of designed architecture of how seating should take place and how this should be copied. And then local organizations had to uh, 
also before the event actually started had to also document of how they would want to implement this and had to cross check this with the Danish Board of Technology if they were allowed to do this. So there were quite some rigid ways of trying to control local organizations of how to, um, to conduct the whole setting and setup for uh, the debates. Uh, and also here, there were uh, quite some attempts to diverge from this global um, uh, structured way uh, as the Danish Board of Technology proposed it. And then as well, when setting the agenda and providing information about global biodiversity, so how to present the policy issue at stake, there were very different ideas of how to do this. So uh, for instance, the organizations involved in Germany and US were science museums conducting the whole event. And so there were lots of experts on biodiversity actually involved. So they tried to intervene in how the information material that citizens and participants would receive about biodiversity, how this would be structured. Once they were not satisfied as they were in the US, they simply decided, okay, we will let them talk about global biodiversity, but everything that is not captured there, we will add on in um, additional sessions and discussions on national biodiversity issues. This they were allowed to do by the Danish Board of Technology, but it was not considered for the whole um, documentation of the, the event. So the, the whole documentation of the event resulted in a, in a website, which rather survey like was just presenting like the votes that uh, participants um, took at the very end of the, um, the discussions um, on specific predefined questions on, on uh, biodiversity. Um, and again, it was a combination of documents like this informational document on biodiversity, uh, which had a material component as well. This was standardized and translated in all the different uh, languages of countries involved, um, but there was no divergence allowed from this text, um, <clears throat> which obviously also caused quite some discussion. But then there were um, the different ways of um, how, yeah, the different forms of ordering were at stake. So um, I might just come back to this analytical discussion if there were specific people interested in the room to discuss this further. Beyond that, I'd rather like to uh, highlight my uh, second conclusion, uh, which was really insightful was to see like how there was this front stage performance versus backstage reality. So while the Danish Board of Technology was very concerned about that, the whole methodology should be kind of performed in a very coherent and um, kind of consistent way. Um, there was very obvious um, that this was a bit of a technocratic approach, also in a very managerial uh, version of democracy. They tried to kind of um, dominate uh, with their specific vision, the other countries and their occasionally um, diverging ideas about how to do that in order to come up with something that they claimed to, 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 to be a global public as the sum of comparable national publics. Um, and then we had those divergences uh, in the US and in Germany. In the US, it was very important to have this national dimension and the national framing of what is biodiversity. And in Germany, it was also much more um, the attempt to highlight how um, actually the specific reasoning for a certain views of participants um, uh, played a role of how they came up with a certain voting results. So there was much more, again, like a Habermasian understanding of rationality in there. So they were interested in how was the reasoning uh, across different subjectivities and they found their methodological ways of how to do that. Okay, so obviously this is a contribution to um, the sociology of standards, but also um, potentially to um, a sociological perspective on transnational citizen engagement. Um, <clears throat> and the further research I will skip, um, but I still quickly would like to come to this slide before I come to an end. Um, so um, potentially for, for people who might be interested in like, so in the question, so what? So what would we learn also uh, for a practical uh, matters on organizing democracy? And um, from um, this case study, uh, I would conclude that um, definitely um, it's worth to have uh, a little bit an alternative way than uh, as the Danish Board of Technology uh, tried to be rather much more sensitive for um, local and cultural um, divergences and in order to get there, 
to have a bit more of a bricolage approach, I would call it, and acknowledging a rather iterative process of uh, inclusion and acknowledging and integrating the local experiences with this design. Um, <clears throat> and also to rather call it potentially an experiment and also to acknowledge how this actually creates a certain path dependency. And obviously what might help as well is to have a reflexive approach about this. So having joint explication and reflection of those values and putting them also um, uh, on the table for further discussion. Obviously this is a, a very ambitious and potentially elitist approach, but um, might help actually to spell out these implicit um, divergences of uh, visions and values. Um, and obviously there's also the potential um, suggestion towards having a bit more of an anarchistic or antagonistic approach in the sense of aiming at a more hierarchical free and also voluntarily and potentially also a bit more like social movement uh, inspired approach, uh, which obviously comes with the suggestion to acknowledge uninvited or better also self-invited engagement, which would be even beyond those very um, um, standardized choreographed forms of um, organizing engagement. Okay, so uh, I just mentioned here two uh, publications where um, in this article I have also worked uh, more around the term of technology of participation, which shall um, in particular uh, make clear this aim of the way of how participation becomes so strictly designed in methodology, it can become a technology which is worth in becoming again deconstructed and opened up um, for a focus on the black box behind and the values uh, inscribed in there and another book chapter in this uh, citizen participation and global environmental governance book. Um, thank you. <laughs>